doesn't need an introduction, of course. Um, so today uh, he's going to talk about the cellular automaton interpretation of quantum mechanics. Thank you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm quite happy to be here in electronic presence. Um, this talk is about uh, some very recent progress which I made. Now let's so re very recent progress which I made on a theory that which I have been cherishing for some time, the way I look at quantum mechanics, where quantum mechanics has is losing some of its uh, aura, some of its mystic mysticism or whatever. It is just a mathematical procedure. And indeed it is, as I will try to explain, but I won't go into too much detail. It is a mathematical procedure to handle statistics and probabilities. So statistics comes in in a very natural way when you deal with a classical system obeying classical equations, but the degrees of freedom are far too many to handle them all individually. So you're forced to do statistics and that statistics will automatically come out to be not just statistics in the way people do in statistical mechanics, but it really comes out quantum mechanically. And I'll try to explain that. Um, the work I've sent to the archive uh, a few days ago, uh, so you see the archive number here. Uh, you're welcome to, to read the more complete story on that um, in that article. So uh, a cellular automaton is basically what the word says, you uh, divide space into a grid. Now, putting things on a grid is a quite normal procedure in many branches of physics. Think of the weather forecast, you put the, the planet Earth on a grid, but we can also put models of elementary particles on a grid. So by itself, having a grid is nothing special in physics, um, but it, it enables one to do calculations. Um, and they, there are two very important, apparently different ways of putting something on a grid. One is totally classical, like a weather forecast, like the question where schools of fish are moving in the ocean. All that is just classical physics. And uh, uh, you make it suitable for handling the thing on the computer because on the computer you can program that every cell can be in a certain number of states. You never know whether these states will be triangles or spheres or particles or whatever. The only thing we can say about these grids is that they obey equations. The, the cells in the grids obey equations. So you have degrees of freedom, which you might decide to enumerate from one to 211, from one to 1000, from one to 10 to 26. However you want to do it, you uh, have a number on this grid and this number evolves according to some evolution law. Now there are two kinds of evolution laws which we, we will consider, which are very important. One is a totally classical evolution, but the other is you can put quantum mechanics on a grid. Uh, and also this is often done in physics, particularly in particle physics. You put the, Sch the, the Schrodinger equation or the Dirac equation or any equation you like on a grid. And then you postulate quantum interactions typically between neighboring cells only. You might consider next to neighbor cells as you want. That's a detail that I won't go into, but basically cells typically affect only their neighbors and not directly far away friends. Uh, the signal from one cell to a distant other cell has to go via the cells lying in between, uh, as you would expect from any ordinary physical system, including the weather also air pressure here and clouds here will affect clouds and air pressure in the neighborhood, but far away, well, it takes some time for signals to travel. This is very much like this physical world that you actually see today. Signals take some time to travel and the, typically the time is determined by the speed of light in all directions. Actually, to have the same speed of light for signals in all directions on a grid is quite hard and usually it doesn't quite happen that way, but we feel that it may be well possible in physics to make models which are such that also in the diagonal direction, the same speed of light for signals is achieved as in 
in the favored directions of the grid. But those are details that I won't be too much concerned about, that, that's for later. But first you want to understand what the relation is between classical grids and quantum grids. And that's what most of my talk will be about. How you can see that the classical grid can sometimes we get very typical quantum properties and the converse, uh, how that can happen. And this brings me in conflict with uh, Bell's theorems and so on. And of course, there's a lot to be said about that. But I'll try to keep it at a minimum in this talk. In this talk, I just want to focus on the physical equations, the mathematical equations, which are very important. And if you understand those equations, you can really understand what I'm talking about, what I'm thinking about. And then we can um, put those in, under the microscope and see, well, how sensible are these equations? How sensible are the ideas that you're talking about? So the talk is mainly about the following, which I should get the status of a conjecture, although I'm pretty sure I gave the arguments that prove the conjecture, but it's not with total mathematical precision. So I have to be a bit careful about that. And that is that every cellular automaton, no matter what its, its laws of evolution are, will be mathematically equivalent to a genuine quantum theory on a lattice. So even if you take a classical automaton with classical laws, you can write these laws in the quantum mechanical language. And for all practical purposes, it will be quantum mechanics. So of course, you have to make a distinction between a language where you use Hilbert space just because you, you are in love with Hilbert space. That's fine. But you can also say, no, there's more to it than that. It, it will also generate all the usual, typically quantum mechanical phenomena, such as interference, such as the Born amplitudes, such as the Schrodinger equation, and all that, including all the axioms and rules about making a measurement, about what you think that happens when a wave function collapses, all that will be included in the quantum picture. So that's quite a conjecture, and I'm sure there'll be many of my listeners right now who will not believe me. And you're quite welcome not to believe me. I'll try to explain why I think this is a true statement. Now, it happens up to some energy. And yesterday there were talks where I briefly raised the questions about energy, but it wasn't really answered. But to me, it's very important that um, this conjecture holds below a certain energy per particle, or you can say at temperatures which are sufficiently low. At low temperatures, only energies up to some level are reached. Energies beyond that level are unimportant. You can leave those states out. So what I'll talk about is typically the standard model of the subatomic particles up to some energy. Energy experiments are done at the LHC in Geneva. The LHC goes to a couple of TeV per particle, typically 10 TeV or something like that, and 14 TeV, but not more. So we can't reach higher energies than that in the LHC. And consequently, we have no idea whatsoever what the laws of nature are beyond that energy. And uh, in, for me, it's now very important that I say that the models I'm talking about will give me a very accurate mimic of a quantum theory up to some energy. Beyond that energy, the departure from the quantum theory that you might want to look at will be bigger, but also experimentally today out of reach. So yes, there will be deviations from standard model physics beyond 14 TeV, but no, we have no way of checking that experimentally. That has two sides to it. One is there could be an error which comes, becomes very big at high energies. But the other thing is maybe you have to make models like this. Maybe nature does care about uh, reality and classical behavior beyond a certain energy. So in that case, the theories I'm talking about will be predictive. They will tell you what will happen beyond the 14 TeV or so at CERN. And that will make the thing very interesting. Same remarks about cosmology. 
uh, cosmologists think of uh, effective Hilbert spaces to describe the Big Bang and everything that have to happen shortly after at typically energy scales much, much bigger than the LHC scale. So maybe the theories that I'm talking about will have something to say about that. For, the, for me, this is a very important motivation. I'm not talking about thin air. I'm not talking about vague philosophical concepts. No, I'm talking about real physics and trying to make either predictions or possibilities to falsify the theory when you do experiments at some point. So the statement is very important that at ultra high energies, way beyond the LHC, the theory could be false or the theory could be predictive. Um, and we have Bell's theorem. I'm very much aware of what Bell has been trying to set to, to talk about and trying to, to understand. Bell was as concerned as I am about the reality of, that lies behind quantum mechanics. And Bell came with his theorems trying to prove that, these, uh, that, that what I'm doing right now is impossible. But why is it impossible? I showed you that it doesn't look so impossible. I showed you why I think it doesn't look impossible at all. Now, uh, I'm not going into these today and we can leave until after lecture. People can raise the questions about Bell's theorem, of course. You can raise questions about all sorts of of uh, paradoxes in quantum mechanics or uh, whatever. Um, but I bring up for it right now that usually when people talk about Bell's theorem, they say, well, we have practically surely proven that there are no hidden variables or the breakdown locality and all these, this stuff. There's just a tiny loophole. And I just saw a, a talk by uh, Shelley Glasher the other day, also mentioned that Bell everybody believes Bell's theorem. There is just a formal tiny little loophole in the theorem, but nobody takes care of that. For me, a loophole is a loophole. There are no such things as tiny or large loopholes. There are loopholes, which means that there is a source of, of error of this theorem. And I believe that the, um, the, the things people are worried about when they, when they looked at Bell's theorem, are indeed reasons to worry about. And I think that loophole is one which I have to creep through in defending my theory. Be that as it may, you may or may not believe that, I'll tell you in, in what direction I'm thinking, what my um, procedures are. I have to use some concepts, which many of you have seen before, but just to be for completeness, I mentioned that again, in quantum mechanics, we work with operators. And these operators, you can, you can then measure and you can consider their expectation values and so on and so forth. And you can, do, you can study what they do to wave functions. I consider three kinds of operators. There's first an operator I call beables. Now, beables normally do not occur in quantum mechanics as we know it. So when you look at the hydrogen atom or at other quantum systems, you'll typically not find any beables. But beables are very important to me. They are special kinds of operators, which in Bell's own language would show something that is really there. It's not something I'm talking about, not epistemic, but it's really uh, ontic. It describes something that is there to be touched, like your laptop, like, uh, like, like the moon, anything which is really there because it's, observed and there's no question no maybe no statistics no probabilities it's there yes or no and then it's called a beable um, and i'll explain to you that even in ordinary quantum mechanics one may construct such beables i'll give you some examples there are also changeables now a changeable is an operator that says these beables evolve in time oh i forgot to mention for the beables uh, it's important to see when can you be sure that you, you look at an operator in quantum mechanics, when is that operator beable? In quantum mechanics, it just means that, it, that you can diagonalize the operator and then all the eigenvalues are things that are kind of really there. The eigenstates are realized or not realized, but never in a superposition, not in the real world. But quantum mechanically, if you have a quantum theory, it means that uh, the beables all commute with one another 
because it's a classical theory that describes their evolution. So the beebles are operators that commute. Well, we have commuting operators in quantum mechanics. So all by itself, that's not so strange. But they also commute with the values that beebles take in the future and in the past. That is something that normally doesn't happen in ordinary quantum mechanics. It only happens in very special quantum theories where you can have a beeble that continues to be a beeble over time. So that a beeble now commutes with the beeble at later or at earlier times. That is very exceptional. Normally it doesn't happen in quantum mechanics, but it just may happen in some very special quantum theories. And those are the theories I'm going to talk about. Then I need the concept of changeable which is also an operator, but that operator tells you how a beeble evolves. A beeble right now will not look the same as the beeble a minute from now, a thousand years from now, but they evolve. And the evolution is described by using changeables. A changeable is an operator that transforms the beeble into another beeble. So also the Hamiltonian of uh, a classical system can be described by a Hamiltonian, and that Hamiltonian will also be a changeable. The Hamiltonian tells you how the system behaves a short moment later uh, in compared to what it is now. And maybe the theory is a classical theory. In that case, the Hamiltonian is a changeable. It, it replaces beebles by beebles. And then you have all the rest. And most quantum theories only have operators of this sort, which are called this junk that's left over. If I take out the beebles and the changeables, I call them superimposables. They are superimposed. When you act with such an operator to a beeble, you get a superposition of beebles. And if you ask how these, in, how these evolve in time, they always evolve as superpositions of other operators when you follow these in time. So now let me go to business and give you an example of a very simple quantum system that is quantum mechanical and classical at the same time. So you, I have in this picture here a simple model that has in this case, if you count carefully, you find there are 11 blobs in here. These blobs represent a state of some system. So you can think of a classical oscillator. You can think of a wheel turning around, a classical gear, nothing quantum mechanical about it. It's the wheel of your car, which could look like this, that after a certain moment in time, the state which used to be here will now be sitting there, this state will be sitting there, and so on. And uh, when I have such a classical system, nothing stops me from saying, okay, these are cats. I describe them as if they were quantum cats. That is just a description. It has nothing to do with the physical law itself. The physical law says the wheel rotates, rotates like the wheel of your car or your bicycle or your legs when you walk. It's all periodic motion that I'm talking about. The periodic motion, however, can be described in quantum mechanical language. At this level, it's just a language. I use the unitary operator U to say that this beable here will transform into this beable there after a certain amount of time, delta t. And I describe that using an evolution operator U. U is basically a matrix slightly off the diagonal, which tells you the state number one evolves to state number two, state number two evolves to state number three, and so on until you, you, make, you came full circle, and then you go back to state number one, or state number zero, uh, the way you, depending on how you enumerate these, these states. Now, U can be written as e to the minus i h. That is true for all unitary operators. So whether this is a quantum system or a classical system doesn't make any difference. I can always find uh, the logarithm of this U, which sits in this exponent here, to describe u as e to the minus i h delta t. At the same time, this h acts as a Hamiltonian. And sure, you can't deny that this operator h tells you how a system psi evolves, d psi dt is minus i h on psi. You recognize the Schrodinger equation, but this is just the equation you need that if the time is an integer multiple of delta t, then this equation just tells you that this cat goes into this cat and that one goes into that and so on. So this is a way to map a completely classical system onto something that starts looking quantum mechanical. Not only that, it is a quantum system that many of you will recognize as the harmonic oscillator. I'll explain to you why. 
First, let me do some mathematics. This is very straight, simple mathematics, but I want to diagonalize u. Why? Well, for mathematical manipulations, diagonalizing an operator is always very useful. And diagonalizing this operator is very easy. I take all these states together. I give them this e to the two pi i k n over n amplitude, a complex amplitude, and I, I take the sum. This is just a discrete Fourier transformation. I have 11 entries here. I take uh, the discrete Fourier transformation of 11 entries. It goes this way. You have to divide by the square root of 11 to get the right norm. And um, so these states are called K ontological. So K is a number enumerating those states. The superscript ont says that these are the ontological states, the states the world is really in. And, um, uh, and then I have N of E, which are the eigenstates of this operator U. It's very easy to see that they are the eigenstates. U of N gives you, uh, this is N rotated by a complex factor. Um, I can invert this transformation backwards so that I can Fourier transform backwards. All you have to do is put a minus sign in the Fourier coefficients and you get, you're going to go back from N of E to the ontological states. Both these can be used as a basis of a Hilbert space. It's not really Hilbert space because it's a finite dimensional vector space. But apart from that, you can use these as basis elements. Normally, you would think of the case to form the natural basis of this Hilbert space. In this basis, you can see that the thing is ontological and it's just classical. But I can also use the basis of the energy states and they're also uh, little n, they're also capital N different little n states. They are as good as a basis of Hilbert space as the k's are. I can switch from one to the other very easily. The advantage of going to the energy eigenstates is that you can very now, now very easily compute the Hamiltonian in that same Hilbert space, in that uh, same basis, because u is diagonal. Therefore, the Hamiltonian is just whatever you find in this exponent, that will be the Hamiltonian. This will, um, well, you can, you can check that uh, if, if that u being diagonal in this basis, u is just e to the two pi i n little n over big N. So, Knowing that, I can just take this, uh, this exponent apart and call that the Hamiltonian. The little delta t here is just a number I can put downstairs. Capital N times delta t happens to be the entire period of this thing. How much time does it take to make full circle? And uh, 2 pi over that is, of course, the angular velocity. So h is the angular velocity times capital N uh, times little n, sorry, little n is uh, enumerating the basis elements. You recognize this as a Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator. But the only difference with the harmonic oscillator is that the sequence stops. In this case, after 11 steps, they, those are all the energy states. But otherwise, they are omega times n, omega is the period, just like or an inverse period, just like the harmonic oscillator. In fact, I can take the continuum limit of this thing, and the only difference between this thing and its continuum limit is that in the continuum limit, delta t goes to zero, but now this sequence of states goes all the way to infinity. Capital N goes to infinity, and now the levels still start at zero, going all the way to infinity. That is exactly the level spectrum of the harmonic oscillator. And here comes the first conclusion from, from this theory, that the harmonic oscillator is an example of a quantum mechanical system that has ontological states. Because now I can take the energy levels of the harmonic oscillator, subject them to the inverse of this Fourier transform here, which I also wrote down, and then I can, can I get states k, but now, I, but in the continuum limit, they are re represented by a continuous angle phi. And this continuous angle phi just rotates around the circle like this in the complex plane, if you want. If you want to write e to the i phi, you get the complex plane, and then this thing just rotates around. So this phi is an ontological state. So the pure harmonic oscillator is a theory that's not really quantum mechanical, but if you look at the right basis, you just find an ontological thing, a beable, going around to operate the thing forever.
that's the harmonic oscillator. Now you might, uh, oh yes, and you see that in the continuum limit, if we compare this thing with the continuum limit, you see very little changes. The, the sum becomes an integral in here. The, uh, and, and here the sum was over a finite number of states, now it becomes the sum of an infinite number of states. And that's about the difference. So the continuum limit of this periodic chain is very easy to find. It is exactly the quantum harmonic oscillator. And now you can just postulate rather than derive, you postulate that the amplitude squares are the probability that you have a particular state. You can say that for the energy eigenstates, you can also say that for the states on, on the circle here, you can take a distribution, a probabilistic distribution on the circle, find that this distribution rotates around the circle just as well, and you can declare that the amplitude square here are the Born amplitudes. So the Born amplitude is not something I derive, I can just declare that to be the probabilities. It works perfectly fine. So the harmonic oscillator is an ontological theory in this guise, because maybe you didn't realize that when you were looking at the harmonic oscillator, all your life basically, you, everything oscillates, you didn't realize that you're looking at something ontological, something that isn't quantum mechanical. Now I make the next step. The next step is that I can have a slightly more complicated model, which is not a single circle, but the possibilities of several different closed states. And this, this simply happens if we have the following thing. This thing has some over 30, I think 31 blobs, if I remember well, I have here. I take any one of them, say this one, and I've asked how does it evolve in time? This one goes to that, this goes to that, this goes to that. After six steps, you happen to reach back to the original state thing you started off with. But you could have started with this thing, then after eight steps, you're back from where you started from. Here you're after three steps, here after 12 steps, here after two steps. So you can have many, you can start anywhere you like and you enter with a different period. Now that could be the content of one single cell in my automaton, because I hadn't told you that you have to go through all states to reach back to the same state where you started before. But it could also be that you, you end in the same state sooner than, and that you didn't get all the other states in between. To get the other states, you have to start over again into some other thing, and then you, you enter into these other states. So this is just a simple description of what you could also have in a single cell of a cellular automaton. Now this thing is more complicated than my harmonic oscillator. Because any single unit like this, yes, it has equally spaced levels. So this thing with six states has six energy levels. You can continue because Hamiltonian with discrete time, Hamiltonian actually is a periodic operator. After six steps, you're back to where you are before. So the Hamiltonian becomes periodic. That's only because my time step is finite. If my time steps were infinitesimal, the Hamiltonian would go all the way to infinity. So these are numbers of, of levels that you get if you, uh, you start in this state. But you could also have started in this one or any of the others, and then you get more le energy levels. These are of this thing are closest together because it takes long to get to a period. Here you, take, you need 12 steps to get into a period. So these are these 12 levels, which are closer together than those. You might not see that immediately, you just have to take on faith that if you take these, all these things together, you get this set of energy steps. Since there's energy conservation, and since in this picture, it's impossible to jump from one to another circle, you can still decide to add a constant to the definition of energy. It's still conserved energy, and you don't know how to define the Hamiltonian from first principles, because there are no first principles here. So maybe they are not quite synchronous. They don't have a joint vacuum state. Maybe one of these is the vacuum state, of say one in, 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 in this, chain, it could also have been anywhere else in the chain, is a true vacuum. That sits here. But um, you have all these energy states now, and now you can merge them. And when you merge them, you see that the energy spectrum becomes lovely and complicated now, chaotic nearly. It's not chaotic, it's just a merge of, of these uh, five different uh, things. But it looks pretty chaotic at first sight. You can imagine if it take many more cells, and each cell having many more states, that the energy spectrum can become quite 
complicated, and from my point of view also quite generic. So now we can actually have quite a, a few uh, different states here. And now you might also imagine maybe if I look at the standard model, maybe its energy spectrum doesn't look that much different from this one. That would mean that energy-wise, the standard model will generate the same states as you see here. But that's all I can say about describing these things. So maybe the standard model is, this, is of this kind. And maybe if I'm clever enough, I could disentangle these states to form sets of this sort. And maybe I can draw this diagram for the standard model. That would be fantastic. It hasn't happened and it won't happen very soon. If someone will figure out how to do this, it's going to be very hard. Maybe it's impossible. Most likely it's impossible. For instance, the standard model may not contain everything there is. It doesn't contain all the quantum gravity features of the, of the gravitons. It doesn't contain dark matter, you name it. So we haven't got the standard model yet. We haven't got it complete. So of course the standard model will not have this shape, but maybe one day it will. And that's a conjecture that it's not inconceivable that the particle series that we have today actually have this form. And then I will be able to do the Fourier transformation backwards and identify all these different states for the standard model. That would be quite something. Now I want, I, have a, I want to do something more. I want to take this in every cell. In every cell, the cell automaton, I put these things. And now I ask, what about interactions? So now let's introduce interactions. And I'll first show you the first interaction you can think of in a single cell. That may not yet sound so interesting, but I want my cells to be as general as possible. So the interaction I already have is that the Hamiltonian brings me from one blob to the next. That's one possible interaction, but there may be more kinds of interaction. There could be another interaction that says, if you enter into one of these green uh, cells here, the next step is not that you go to this one, but the next step is you jump. You jump from here to there and then you continue. That is another kind of interaction. Now, let me first tell you that um, this interaction can also be expressed in quantum mechanical language. I'm using quantum mechanics as a language, not as a theory here. I take the old Hamiltonian, now I rewrite the old Hamiltonian as H equals P. That's actually, is a very good Hamiltonian for something going with a constant speed. So the particle that, that you see moving around in, in this, uh, in, in, on this trajectory, that particle moves with a constant velocity. A constant velocity is given by the Hamiltonian H equals P. But this P is periodic, so it has a lowest value and a highest value. And that is of course, the set of equally spaced eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So um, this P just gives me the unperturbed Hamiltonian. Now the question is, how can I write an interaction such that if you enter here, you don't continue in that direction, you flip to this point and then you continue there. If you would end up in this point, just for unitarity, you want to flip to this point and then you continue in this direction. So how do I do that? That is a little mathematical exercise. But the result of the exercise is something very simple. I add to the Hamiltonian one term, which basically projects out the state. The state it projects out is not K1 or K2 themselves. It projects out the superposition of K1 minus K2. And minus sign is very important, and you'll see why in a minute. That I take the state of psi, I normalize it with the square root of two, so it has norm one again, but it's the superposition of this state with that state. I'm not saying I'm certainly going to do a quantum theory. No, this is the classical theory in disguise. The classical theory uses a quantum trick to describe this switch here. And if you think for a moment, you can understand why it is so. This Hamiltonian projects out the state of psi as a factor pi, a number pi to the Hamiltonian, and then takes, puts psi back in again. So it takes psi out, multiply by pi, and take psi back in. That multiplication by pi in the Hamiltonian is there for very good reasons. Look at these footnotes here. I'm using the fact that e to the pi i is minus one. So what this Hamiltonian really does in the evolution law is it takes this particular state, multiplies it by minus one, and then says go on with it. If you do that, however, 
take a state and multiply it by minus one, it means you interchange k1 with k2. And that's what this operator does. That's not, that's not really a derivation I gave to you now. I owe you that derivation. You can look it up in, um, uh, in my paper, but you can also do it uh, on the back of an envelope with, with some care. You can see that this is just exactly what you need. This state has a minus sign. The state orthogonal to that, that has a plus here, is unchanged. If you take k1 plus k2, that is not affected by this interchange. But k1 minus k2 is replaced by it minus that. That's just the interchange of k1 and k2. So you can imagine that this is the way to write that Hamiltonian, selecting out the even and odd states in k1 plus or minus k2. It all acts on this one cell k1, but I can also exert, uh, realize, I should realize, this is not really quantum mechanics at all. It's quantum language, but still classical. Because all I really did was I turned the model into this model. And you recognize this. This was my other system where I had two loops instead of one. So, and this is still totally classical. So I did nothing. I just, I taught you so how to talk about this in quantum language, and that's all. I didn't turn this into quantum theory. This is not quantum mechanics at all. Quantum mechanics would be, this would be a quantum interaction. How do I do that? And here comes the amazing thing. It's easy to do that. Turn this into a quantum interaction. I do the following thing way. I don't like that factor pi. That factor pi just replaced the state into minus state. If I would have one third pi there, then it would be a genuine quantum mechanical interaction. It would turn K1 into a superposition of K1 and K2. Isn't that much more interesting? Yes, it is. And here it comes how to do that. I take it a neighboring cell. It's important this cell here must be one of the neighbors of this cell. Well, in three dimensions, you have quite a few neighbors. So take any one of these neighbors and then say, this neighbor also runs around with the same typical frequency, but this neighbor has two kinds of cells in it. It has an empty cell, has a cell with a little, little green blob in it. If the neighbor is in the little green blob and here you have reached this K1, then yes, you make the switch. If the neighbor is in an empty blob, I don't make the switch, I just continue from here to here. So now you see with this idiot neighbor, this situation here has become more complicated. You can jump from one to the other or you can stay in one loop forever depending on what this cell does here. So that is still totally classical, but more complicated. And you can imagine if I do this with all the cells in a cellular automaton, it's going to be a hell of a bit more complicated than it was before. That situation I want to describe. And now I claim I can use quantum mechanical language and now the result will look a lot more interesting. This is now my Hamiltonian. What did I do? I took the same Hamiltonian I had before, I have the cell one and cell two, they both go around with a constant velocity, the same velocity. So the coefficient between those, these two momentum variables are the same. I have the same projection operator that tells me to switch. But now this operator tells me I only switch if I'm in one of these states K. Uh, there's a sum of states K and this is a projection operator that projects out this state, tells me to make the switch and then uh, leaves the state as it were. So this is just projecting out that state. But you can also say, wait a minute, if this thing is in a very low energy state, here comes the notion of energy. If this state is in a low energy state, then I'm in a quantum wave, which says that I have to superposition all these states in a zero energy mode. Remember the zero energy mode had all these states here with the same amplitude in it. So now it says, that that zero energy mode, I can also apply this projection operator on it. I get the same zero energy mode, but I get it multiplied by a factor. And the, since the one third of these states are green, the rest is yellow, this actually gives me a factor one third. However, at high energies, something else happens. This doesn't replace the state back into the same uh, low energy state I had before. It takes a superposition of this low energy state with high energy states where things rapidly oscillate when you are in, in, in one of these modes. However, and here comes my, uh, my statement about energy. 
I can't see it high energy state. It's too high energy. And actually I have to wait until two of these uh, events happen to see that a low energy state returns to a low energy state again. And the high energy states are invisible to me. But what it does do is multiply the whole amplitude by a factor one third. So now I get pi over three. And in this uh, statement here, in this uh, cell here, that's a quantum interaction. This is how quantum mechanics comes in, provided that I insist I'm only looking at low energy states here. So that means if I take all energies into account, it's still completely classical. If I don't see the high energy states, the effect of these high energy states is only that the low energies are visible. In low energy language, this is a quantum effect. So now you see why I believe quantum mechanics comes in if you look at the only low energy states and you can't see the high energy states. So this is a projection operator and the projection operator gives me a factor alpha, gives me the fraction of states which are in the low energy mode. I don't see the high energy modes. So as far as I'm concerned, they're not there. Now I have a genuine interaction that tells me that there is a, um, uh, effective uh, interaction Hamiltonian here, which is which has a coefficient L epsilon, which is now much much less than pi, and now it has become really quantum. Um, so I can adjust all the off-diagonal term now of my Hamiltonian. My Hamiltonian will have this added to it, and um, um, uh, this is now. The nice thing about this is that this Hamiltonian has now off diagonal terms, just like in quantum theory. Now I can do this with the off diagonal terms, but I also affect the on diagonal terms because I have K1 minus K2 squared. So when I look at the all contributions from this state Psi, I also get a modification of the on diagonal terms of the Hamiltonian. Now I can handle those as well. Uh, Chairman, I don't know for sure how much time I still have, but I will have some time for discussion afterwards as well. So, um, uh, you still have uh, 50 mi 20 yes, minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, that's more than I need. So then I have some time for discussion. I hope to get some discussion here. I can also modify, correct the on diagonal terms because maybe I didn't want those modifications on the diagonal of my Hamiltonian. I want to remove those again. So how do I do that? Well, the on diagonal terms just tell you basically how fast the thing is moving from cell to cell. So now I can take that the velocity depend on which cell I am. Normally that has no effect. The reason is that if I have just your monocle oscillator or nothing else, it doesn't, the time variable there is a completely arbitrary man-made object. My watch can be a very bad watch. So uh, if things go fast or slow, makes no difference physically. So having a Hamiltonian moving fast on one diagonal spot and slowly on another diagonal spot has no effect if I look at a pure harmonic oscillator. But I can have these same off diagonal terms elsewhere in my system caused by other neighboring cells. And then the velocity of the system at any particular spot does have an effect. So the on diagonal terms of the Hamiltonian are non-trivial, but they are easily easy to realize as well, according to very similar arguments. So I'm not too much concerned about the on diagonal terms of the Hamiltonian. Only at the very highest energy, I, oh, oh yes, this is the following important state I nearly forgot to say, that by choosing which transitions take place, which K do I interchange, I can reach all spots on the entire matrix for the Hamiltonian. So I can affect all of the diagonal components that I want on the Hamiltonian by using the same trick again and again and again. There are some worries. If you do this too many times, you might modify the Hamiltonian so much that the energy eigenstates aren't anymore the ones I started off with. So you have to watch out. It's not totally trivial that you can do this as, much, as many times as you want. So there are dangers in this procedure. This is why I call this a conjecture. I can't be totally sure because if I do this too many times, I run out of the domain where I can trust my approximation techniques. So saying that my wave function is completely flat 
as a function of, of the position where I am because I'm looking at the lowest energy state. That argument doesn't quite hold anymore if I, um, if I have too many other interactions taking place at the same time. So then I'm getting to a fight with the perturbation uh, expansion. And so this is why I have a conjecture, but I, at the same time I can say, well, whatever happens, I can modify my Hamiltonian again and again, only by using ontological interactions in my original system. But as long as I look at low energy modes only, I can probably modify my Hamiltonian any way I like by repeating the argument again and again and again. Only at the very highest energies, I can't use this excuse anymore. At the highest energy, my system should be truly classical. And now it makes a difference. At the highest energy, I again have to fight with this factor pi in my Hamiltonian. I have a very strong correction to my Hamiltonian or none at all. That means that my models become more coarse grained. I may or may not keep this in the true standard model, or I might miss my standard model. And then my theory is wrong. The standard model of particles is not described by ontological theory. So it's just a conjecture that maybe the standard model of all the elementary particles is such a system. And what I happen to have done at very energies might be the correct thing to do. And uh, so it might have physical implications uh, of the theories I believe in or not, do not believe in in this kind of physical world. This picture is a very useful picture to show what happens with my Hamiltonian. These are the on diagonal terms, which are actually slightly off diagonal because I have a, a shift. These terms cause the, the system to shift from one element to the next element. So this tells me that the Hamiltonian has once just one location away from the diagonal so that it describes a match of all the animals going around in circles on, in my cell. So these are, are the, not the delta functions on the diagonal, but delta prime or deltas slightly off the diagonal. But this is basically the diagonal domain of the Hamiltonian. But now if I have far off the angle terms of the Hamiltonian, what I have to do is I take a this state and this state, and classically I say they are just interchanged. Interchanged under a condition uh, arranged by neighboring cells or perhaps by the same cell, and then, um, uh, we say that all together, since this is a uh, lowest energy uh, uh, approximation, um, uh, uh, this interchange gives you effectively an off the diagonal term in the Hamiltonian. And by having the sieve caused by the neighboring cell being very uh, um, restrictive or not, I can make the coefficient here large or small. So now I have an enormous amount of freedom to modify this Hamiltonian any way I like. In all these cases, the underlying theory still is a classical theory. This is why I believe classical theories may possibly generate a Hamiltonian that describes our world. So the assumption is our world is such a deterministic Hamiltonian. But since we are, can only reach the low energy states and nothing anywhere close to the Planck scale where I believe that all this is relevant, just because of that, I can say that uh, on, at the low energy scale, I have so much freedom to use this procedure to get anything I like on the off diagonal uh, entries of a Hamiltonian, that I can almost generate all Hamiltonians that exist, that you can play with. So now you can see that there's so much freedom, maybe all of quantum mechanics can be reinterpreted as a classical theory, which at energies way beyond that I can reach, uh, at those energies, my, uh, my uh, quantum mechanical theory d turns out to be a, a completely classical theory in this guise. I can assure you that if you use this technique, there's no change in points uh, uh, interpretation of the particular coefficients as probabilities. Also the collapse of the wave function, but that is really another seminar, another talk to talk about Bell's theorems, about the collapse of wave functions, about the measurement, it all becomes very trivial if you have an underlying theory that's classical. <clears throat> so even the concept of locality is not affected because if I look at this Hamiltonian here, the um, off diagonal uh, terms should be such that they obey the locality principle. In particle physics, which is, which is truly described by a local 
quantum theory in a quantum local sense is sometimes called is called Bell's uh, uh, no Bell telephone uh, by some smart people uh, who say that the Hamiltonian density only is non-commuting for neighbors. So if x and x prime are very very close together, the Hamiltonian may not commute. But if x and x prime are truly separated by any finite distance, the Hamiltonian density strictly goes uh, commutes. That means I'm only allowed to make this shift if these these and these elements here concern either elements in the same cell or in very closely nearby cells. This makes a difference. So this, this is why I needed this cell to be very close to that cell so that the, uh, ob the property that's known to hold for the quantum theory of elementary particles, that this property is enough to say that my classical theory is also local um, and that locality of the classical theory is linked to the locality of the quantum theory I have. Many questions still to be answered. One is the real world has many, many symmetries. In particular, it has many continuous symmetries. Now this cell automaton is of course notoriously discrete. So how can I realize continuous symmetries in discrete models? Well, I can name you one example, which I didn't mention, but in the paper it's mentioned that the harmonic oscillator I just showed you has some hidden SU2 continuous symmetry in it. So um, uh, in a beautiful way, because I can interpret all the positions of all the cells of the harmonic oscillator as the eigenstates of L3 in a, a rotating top. So um, uh, angular momentum is, is disguised in this cellular automaton uh, if, uh, for every cell. And that, so every cell has an SU2 local symmetry built in it. So you can see that uh, this local symmetry may be of importance. So maybe that's the source of continuous symmetries, but I don't know this. This is some, still some, some mystery that has to be figured out. One continuous symmetry I'm particularly worried about, which is Lorentz invariant. Lorentz invariant is not only a continuous symmetry, it is not a compact symmetry. Lorentz group has infinitely many uh, elements far away. Uh, it's an uncompact, non-compact symmetry. That is particularly difficult to realize in discrete systems. So relativ relativistic invariance is a problem, but the locality that follows from relativity theory is not a problem. So this is why I have some confidence that relativity can be built in in models of this sort. Particularly interesting would be to, to make free particles, a free particle field theory. Free particles, non-interacting particles, look like something you should be able to solve. So my question is, I have not been able to answer the question, what is a cellular automaton describing a free particle? You can think of a free scalar particle, you can also think of a solution of a Dirac equation, an electron or neutrino, but a free electron or a free neutrino. I've come close to describing a massless neutrino uh, in terms of a cellular automaton, but I find it very difficult to turn massive theories, massive Dirac particles into a cellular automaton. It should be possible, but I don't know how to do it. I'm working on it. Uh, I don't know see why it should be impossible, but it's very hard. More generally, we should streamline the mathematics. We should make it as smooth as the mathematics of classical uh, mechanics, the mathematics of Maxwell's equations, of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a tremendously solid mathematical machinery behind it. I don't have a solid mach mathematical machinery here. I just showed you some of the equations, but a lot more should be done to make it look as streamlined as classical mechanics is, as streamlined as quantum field theory is, Young Mills theory and all that. We haven't reached that. And of course, the biggest monster of all, general relativity, it should be included in the whole picture, but imagine that it's hard to put nature on a lattice. It's even harder if that space-time that you want to put on a lattice is actually a curved space-time. You can imagine how difficult that is. So lots and lots of work has to be done. I think these are technical questions which eventually will be answered. Just like Einstein figured out how to do gravity by making space-time curved, um, we want to do quantum mechanics, we want to put space-time on a lattice. That, of course, is very difficult, particularly if space and time are curved. 
but it's not impossible to write down a lattice for curved space time. It's just very hard. You have to work on it. This is what I wanted to say. I hope there's still time for some discussions. I want to know your reactions. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I would ask the audience to ask questions if they have uh, on Zoom chat. And then we will see uh, the order and we look at the questions. Or even if you have comments. You can also reach our email. You can also look at the paper. Uh, I'm quite ready to have a discussion. There are, there are questions I have myself. So I, as I said here in the last slide. So, uh, uh, so of course, there are, there are still mysteries to be solved. Uh. There is uh, uh, Roberto Franceschini who wants to, to talk, so please. Yes. Um, from, from slide 10, it looks like you have an energy dependence maybe on your coefficient alpha, or at least it's yes. not clear to me from, this, uh, from the content of your slide. Epsilon, uh, is not, sorry. Epsilon is not energy, epsilon is just a small number. Uh, alpha, pardon me. Alpha, but alpha, it depends on energy if you look at, uh, if you put that extra, extra spectator cell into a very high energy mode, then then it's actually not a number, but it's, it's a quantum operator. So do you expect that to have an energy dependence? And is that, uh, in case it has it, uh, a special feature of this uh, way of, of obtaining it? quantum mechanics uh, or, or not? Yes, but one imagines, and many people do so in my field, that all this becomes relevant at the Planck scale. So when the energy reaches the Planck energy or it comes anywhere close to it, then yes, epsilon will be a full, uh, epsilon or alpha will be a full-fledged operator. It won't be a C number anymore or a Q number, but um, or, uh, it will be a Q number, but not a C number. So. Uh, it will be an operator, and that operator may occasionally become large. But if I go to, to this picture here with this thing, if I put these cells very regularly, then at all energy states where the energy is bigger than the inverse size of this distance, then uh, you see that, uh, that the effect of this becomes negligible. And, um, uh, uh, very smooth indeed. So um, alpha will be very, very slightly energy dependent, such a way that by the time you reach the Planck scale, its energy dependence becomes important. But you can imagine that 14 TV is very, very small compared to the Planck scale. So yes, there will be an energy dependence, but no, it will be very weak at a scale where we can probe it with today's experimental techniques. Um, of course, and, it's very important. No, no, it, eventually it will depend on energy, yes. The, the Planck scale is because you like it, uh, as somebody is asking in the chat as well, or there is a fundamental reason why you are connecting uh, the, uh, which the scale, after all, it seems free in what you uh, commented. It must be higher than what has been experimentally tested, which is, of course, fine. Uh, but why do you call in the Planck scale? Uh, That's a very good point. It doesn't have to be the Planck scale for but for what I said today, it doesn't. Many of us believe that the ultimate solution comes from the Planck scale. Because at the Planck scale, the gravitation force starts to couple in everything. And everything is going to change because of gravitational forces, because of space and time themselves being curved. So you have to think again before putting that on the lattice. And um, uh, the other reason why we think the Planck scale is important is that when you do look at black holes, you can argue from first principles that the black holes must come in quantum states. And strange enough, you can count those states. It's an accident that quantum, that black holes give away a secret that they were not supposed to give away. But yes, they do that because if you can do quantum field theory in the background of a black hole, and then you discover that the black hole is in a finite number of quantum states. And if you count those states, you see that very typically these states are counted on a scale 
where the Planck scale enters. So the Planck scale enters, and if you look at the horizon of a black hole, you find typically that the horizon can be can be split on uh, can be put on a lattice, and the lattice uh, size at which you have one digital degree of freedom per unit of lattice size, then that lattice size has the dimension of the Planck scale. But that's a Planck scale in a two-dimensional world, not a three-dimensional world. And uh, that's where uh, holography comes in. So, um, so when I say the Planck scale, I have to say yes, the Planck scale, but only in a two-dimensional sense. So maybe in three dimensions, these numbers are already much more dilute, so that the, the cells may be much larger in three dimensions. So that makes it also physically more interesting that if the cells are much bigger than a Planck cell in three dimensions, because I don't have that many states in a cellular automaton, then uh, it will be something that might be in reach pretty soon by new generation machines, perhaps. Okay, thank you. In general, it's just a question that I, ca I can't answer. You can only speculate. Okay, there is another question from Arash Ardeali. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, what's the relation between the ontic variable states and hidden variables? Well, an ontic variable, in a sense, is the opposite because the ontic variable is completely observable. It is, I'm, I'm talking this theory only about things which are observable. Any beable is in principle observable. It may be very hard to observe them because they carry very much energy. Um, far more energy than the Planck scale. So imagine there's a particle with 20,000 TeV. We can't exclude it today. Maybe such particles exist. They will play a role in this whole game. Because they carry 20,000 TeV or whatever, they'll be invisible to us. So then they are hidden. And uh, so it's quite reasonable to say that probably many degrees of freedom I'm talking about are hidden from us today. Maybe not tomorrow. Of course, a famous hidden variable is dark energy. Dark energy is particles, which probably, or maybe it's something else, but it's hidden from us. It only gives away its gravitational effects. So these are probably degrees of freedom, which could be quite a lot if they are particles. They're hidden from us today, but maybe not tomorrow. Do you call that hidden? Well, not really, but, but temporarily, yes. So. Uh, much of this, of course, is not known, right? I'm saying that um, there's, there's various scenarios for what these degrees of freedom really are. And one scenario is they're truly hidden, but more likely is it that they're hidden from us today, perhaps for the next thousand years, and then someone will, will be able to measure them. Uh, there is another question from Sabine. Uh, please, Sabine. Um, so you declare that there are some states in your theory, which you call K, that are ontic, and superpositions of these states are not. That's um, right. what, what decides which are the ontic states and which states aren't? Oh, in many cases, you are free to choose what your ontic states are. So basically, you're back at square one. If you don't know which of the states are ontic, the things you're looking at are actually superpositions. The rule here is, the rule that I am applying this theory is, there are ontic states, but maybe I will not be able to identify them. This is quite conceivable. Think of the harmonic oscillator. Now, what, I know I have to make Fourier transformation of the energy eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator. But the question, a very legitimate question is, how do I choose the, um, the unit factors in front of the, uh, or the phase factors in front of these energy states. I could probably choose them any way I like. In all these cases, I will get a different ontic behavior theory. So I get a class of beables, which are operators that commute with themselves. But very often, you have many choices of choosing different sets of beables. Then those are the ontic states. The, the set of states that nature choose, cho cho chose is probably impossible to identify. But maybe I don't have to identify. Maybe it's enough to say nature works with ontological states. We don't know which of these states are ontological. Fundamental reasons tell us we will never be able to do that. 
because we are never able to stay into control of every single physical degree of freedom. Think of all the atoms uh, between us uh, uh, in, in town Geneva and further. Think that you have to control all those atoms exactly to identify an ontic state. Well, we will not, never be able to do that. So we will never be able to identify the ontic state. Nor is it my intention that we should try to, of course, it's hopeless. But what one could try instead is identify a theory where you say the ontic states could be this or could be that. In general, the, the expression in terms of the states that you know is such and such. But there will be many amounts of freedom in choosing the phase factors where we still don't know them and you'll never know them. So this will probably stop us from saying we'll try to make predictions better than the quantum predictions. Given a particle, when exactly is the particle going to decay into other particles if it's a radioactive particle? When will this happen? We don't know. It's very unlikely that you ever know. If you give me a particle, I'll never be able to predict when it will decay or not. Which means that I'll never, the reason why I can't predict that is that I can't predict in which ontic state the particle actually is. It will be impossible. It's far too complicated. That's not what you should try to do. But what, what I try to do is identify the theory where ontic particles are at least defined in principle. That's as far as I can go, I think. Okay, so I think my problem is if you say you, you pick your K states, then by definition, any superposition of these states is not ontic. And I don't really see how you can possibly get quantum mechanics back without having superpositions of states. Like if you look at something rather trivial, like uh, interference or something, what, what do you do if you don't have superpositions? Um, I do have superpositions. As soon as I separate states into low energy states and high energy states, we have to go to the beginning. Um, if I go to this, or maybe the continuum limit of this, then you find energy states N. Now, when I do physics, when anybody does physics, you say, I don't know what happens at very high n. So I don't know the contributions of most of these states n. So I assume that they are not there. So I assume that the states n are not excited. That's almost certainly wrong, but it's the best thing you can do. So uh, let's assume these things are not excited. But then uh, by assuming that, you've already lost control of the ontic states and replaced them by superpositions. So we work with superpositions all the time because we are not under control of all the other states. And the rule is superposition in equals superposition out. So you work with the wrong initial state in, you end with the wrong initial final state out. You can never avoid that. This is the reason why we get superpositions in the, uh, as the outcome of our experiments. We, the in experiment should be in an ontic state, but since we never know which ontic state that is, for that reason, we can't find the ontic state out. So all we do is we choose the wrong initial states. They're not wrong because they serve a good purpose. We just look at, at the state which is most likely in, in the inner inertial state, the initial state. But there are very, very many candidates for the initial states, which are all equally like, likely. We take all these different n states. We, we don't know the high energy states. Uh, and so we give them any, any coefficients we like. So we get a very large ensemble of possible n states. But none, usually none of these are the ontic states. We would like to put the ontic state as an initial state, but we are unable, we're not in a position to identify it. Because of that, we get plane waves and as out as final state, which are in superposition. It's just an expression of our ignorance, which we can never get out of. We have to live with that ignorance forever. So that is, in practice, you have to live with superpositions forever. Thank you. Uh, there are many questions, so probably we have to keep going and maybe if somebody is not interested, can just log off. Um, so there is. Uh, so the last word is just that you can always email me or anything and, and okay. continue uh, ask questions. Okay, that's another way. Sure. Uh, so I'm trying to 
read the questions. There's, there is one uh, which is a very general question. It's a bad idea. That's okay, come here from over. No, it's my telephone. It's my telephone. I can't go how you have I'm sorry. Yes, so the question was how to test the idea. I guess it's a general question and how can you answer generally? Um, can you hear me? Yes. So the question was how to test the idea. Um, well, the idea is full of predictions about the standard model and about um, uh, about other um, uh, uh, possible ways in which it behaves. Well, I explained that at high energies, the deviations from the standard model might be considerable. And the set of, of, of theories that work well at very high energy will be much smaller. Uh, but uh, most important is the question, can we make such a theory or not? That's the first question. And that you can only test by tying. So this would be my uh, my procedure. I'll tie to um, do, to produce a um, a theory that works. If I succeed, then I, at least one hurdle has been taken. But quite possibly, I'll not be able to to bring the theory to a good end, and then that was a test in, in a negative sense. But quite likely, one will find something. And then the question is, uh, what does it predict at very high energies? Does it give the usual uh, uncertainties that we're all familiar with, or does it give something uh, substantial at high energies? I can't tell today, but I think uh, this is certainly not ordinary quantum theory that I'm predicting at very high energies. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question from Alessandro, please. Hi. So, bell inequalities mean that quantum theory is something that gives probability without having uh, complete statistics. Uh, no, and in practice, this happens uh, now when you measure something that does not compute, com that the uh, commutator is different from zero. Uh, do you have examples uh, of you know, observables that don't commute uh, obtained from your framework? Um, yes, but they are always ontological in disguise. So eventually uh, I'm saying that um, I'm reproducing all the probabilities of an ontological theory and that sounds very strange in view of Bell's inequalities um, but I claim there is a loophole in Bell and that's in the statistics. He makes certain assumptions about uh, initial states being independent of choices made by Alice and Bob, usually that kind of thing. So there is where I, I simply disagree with Bell that you, you, I think you can't make such an assumption and, uh, and then you can't arrive at this theorem. So there is a way out. But um, the more important question, well, I'm thinking actually you're asking that question is how you can get interference phenomena on the long run because uh, it looks as if interference is very difficult to reproduce in these theories. But what I've done instead is I can reproduce any quantum theory in principle by saying as long as all my particles have energies lower than a certain value, I reproduce Schrodinger's equation. With that, all the consequences of Schrodinger's equations, including interference phenomena. That is my answer, but I realize my answer today is not strong enough because people say, well, you say, you say it's so because it's so. That's not really a good answer. So I want a better answer, and a better answer could be obtained if I would make a classical model that works the way I expect it. And then say all my particles have energies low in terms of the observables of that classical model. And then it should reproduce a probabilistic events that look like interference for any ordinary observer. Uh, but that is extremely hard in practice to do. So as long as it's very hard, I don't have a, have a better answer than saying, well, I'm reproducing quantum theory, therefore I'm reproducing all the consequences of quantum theory as well. And that's all I can say right now. That's not a very good answer, but it's the best answer I have today. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Stephen Watson also, so please. Yeah, thank you. Excellent talk, I very much loved that. I'm seeing that material for the first time. I'm a mathematician who works on trying to characterize effective field theories, for instance, identify and prove what the effective field theory would be from an original field theory. And one of the things that often comes up is that the effective field theory emerges because of a separation of time scales. You have the original time scale of the field theory, let's call that the fast time scale, and the low energy limit actually operates on a slower time scale. So that allows, for example, the emergence of non-locality. So I'm just interested whether or not this picture in my mind is that your uncertainty, this probabilistic effect, is emerging because of a separation of time scales. You're quite right. Um, when I mention high energy, I could also mention small time scale. It's as you know in quantum physics, energy and time are dual to each other. So high energy means small time scales. So if the time scales are much smaller than the inverse of of some 14 TeV, then we know nothing about the physical world. So if deterministic things happen at that scale, then nobody should be surprised that things happen that we don't quite understand today because we have no access to that scale. And so uh, we don't recognize, we, don't, uh, we are not unable to follow what happens at such a small scale. So uh, what you say is exactly right. This is a theory where, I, where one should separate the small time scales from the large time scales. So, so thank you for that. I think I would be happy to write to you because I think there's some mathematical structures that could naturally encode exactly this probabilistic effect that you're speaking of. So yes, thanks for that. Yeah, so I think also mathematicians may well hit upon quantum theory along these lines. If they separate time scales the same way I do, they should bounce into quantum mechanics, not because quantum mechanics is, is a favorite physical theory, but because it helps them solve problems. I have actually seen one example, which is in the Onsager solution of the, of the Ising model. I don't know whether you know anything of that. But Onsager and Kaufmann, lo and behold, they use quantum field theory to solve a classical problem. They have a classical problem. The answer is a classical answer. No quantum mechanics in the problem. No quantum mechanics in the answer. But quantum mechanics in deriving the answer from the problem. I find it a beautiful example. It's the first case that I saw of that nature. It was what set me thinking about quantum mechanics. Okay, thank you. I'll write to you for sure. <laughs> Good. Okay, so there are many other questions, but since the, uh, Professor Toft said that uh, you can ask uh, and send comments by email, I would uh, stop the talk now. And so please ask uh, him directly if you want. Okay, so let's, uh, I'll thank again uh, Professor Toft for this talk. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.